Fencing is how we put things back into a known state in high availability clustering. Fencing is what makes things not break when things go wrong. Fencing is also an integral part of high availability clustering, and as such, interestingly, is one that's very often overlooked, very often not done quite right, very hard to get right, and worth knowing about. And that's why we're here, and that's going to be the topic of our, of our talk here. So let's start off with a five node cluster where everything's working properly. <clears throat> For the sake of argument, this is CoralSync. Different communication layers, but CoralSync is what's used currently by Pacemaker and by Red Hat. They normally send tokens around, no gets a token, sends some messages, passes it on to the next machine. Now, when something goes wrong, and a node stops responding, the rest of the machine, or rest of the nodes in the cluster, they can't make an assumption about what the state of the lost node is. All they know is that it's gone. So, the way this is detected is, they send in a token packet, which is part of the totem protocol, and they wait for a period of time. They don't get it back. They send out another one. Network problems happen. That one doesn't come back. Meanwhile, with each failure, an increment, or a failure count is incrementing. Once it hits a certain threshold, the nodes declare dead. At the point where the nodes declare dead, everything in the cluster freezes and stays frozen until the problem is resolved. That resolution occurs based on a defined protocol. And the way this specific protocol works is um, such that we have to now reorganize our cluster in such a way that the offending node, that is to say the one that is no longer responding, is excluded from the cluster communication, so we continue to keep going. And that's essentially what happens. In, uh, <coughs> from this state, where everyone's a bit confused about what's going on, we now have to go from this five-node cluster to a temporary four-node cluster, where we are isolating that one specific node uh, that's offending. So we are removing that node from the cluster communication and we're sort of erecting a wall between the remaining nodes of the cluster and the one that is currently offending. Um, so we sort of wall off that offending node and the, and the rest of the cluster can continue as normal. Um, and now there's several ways of doing this. This is the general principle of how we do it. We have um, a specific a cluster, and we have one specific node in that cluster that is misbehaving in some shape or form. Normally it just stops responding, and the, the, the key part is here, we don't know why it has stopped responding. It can be anything. It could be the node itself has in effect gone down, or it could be that we're uh, no longer able to communicate with the node for whatever reason, or, let me turn off this mic here because this noise is distracting me. Um, so we have the, the, uh, the option um, we, we could have the situation where the node has in fact gone down. We could have the situation where the node is still alive, but it's just the cluster communication services on the node that have gone down. It could be a situation where everything is working fine, but it's just the network communication stack that is misbehaving in some shape or form. And the other nodes cannot communicate with that <coughs> node anymore. The problematic thing is the cluster at this point does not know. We don't know what the actual reason is. So in order to be safe, in order to be able to continue our cluster service, what we now first need to do is basically isolate, the rest of the nodes keep going, and then we figure out what the actual problem is, and then later we can reform uh, back into the original five node cluster configuration. Now, how can we do this? Basically, it's always the same principle. We want to isolate the node in some way that it cannot interfere with the rest of the cluster anymore. But generally speaking, there's two ways that we can actually do this. And those two, no, uh, two ways we refer to either as power fencing or fabric or storage fencing. For power fencing, um, probably the more common one, you actually reach out and you forcibly shut down the machine. You don't give it a chance to react. You don't rely on the machine responding to an active power off call. You cut the power. The two major methods of doing this is either using the server's out-of-band management card, IPMI, or one of the um, tier one derivatives like HP Xylo, um, IBM's RSA, um, and so on. You basically call out-of-band to tell it shut down, 
the other option is to switch to PDU. You call the PDU, you tell the PDU, pop the relays, don't allow power to that node anymore. So in the cluster, when the node's been lost, when it's going to use power fencing, one or more of the nodes in the surviving members of the cluster actually calls the out-of-band management card or the PDU and says, cut the link off. You need to be very careful when setting it up. What Florian was hinting at with the tricky to get right isn't necessarily the skill problem, it's that you have to test everything. You have to make sure that when you first build your cluster that you use all the fence methods you've built and you've tested them all individually against all the nodes in the cluster. You can never assume that it's going to work right. Um, you have to make sure you get the credentials, you have to make sure that the cables are right, you have to make sure the power cables are plugged into the proper um, power outlets and PDUs, which is particularly tricky when you've got redundant power supplies, you have to make sure they all trip. So that's one way to do it. This is actually physically removing the node that was previously a part of the cluster from the cluster. It just is removed from the cluster communication, it's no longer part of the cluster, and therefore it cannot interfere with the cluster resources anymore. A slightly more involved way of doing it, maybe not so straightforward, is what we refer to as fabric fencing or storage level fencing. So how does this work? Now note we're using a bit of a simplification here. Um, so this, the arrows that you see in this diagram here still represent the cluster communication links just like we used earlier. But here in this case, there is another link that all of the cluster resources use toward a shared resource, that shared resource being storage, and because it would be slightly confusing to just leave all the arrows in, we're just kind of fading out the cluster communication parts and we're just concentrating on the links to our storage. Now we can have multiple ways of talking to shared storage, but arguably the most common type is we have a logical unit that is somewhere on a storage array um, and we talk to that via some form of SAND. What kind of transport that SAN uses is relatively unimportant for the purpose of this, this discussion. It could be a fiber channel SAN, we could be talking to this over InfiniBand and SRP, it could be iSCSI, either over TCP or over InfiniBand, whatever it may be. If we just have some form of shared resource, shared storage resource, that all of the cluster nodes uh, access together. And now, the principle is relatively similar to the one in node fencing. We have either one or several of the remaining nodes in the cluster uh, removing the node from shared resources, but now we're not doing so by removing the node itself from the cluster, but rather we are removing its access to storage. So we have another node intervening with, the rest, uh, with, with, the, with that offending node, by cutting its connection to the, uh, to, the, to the storage itself. A simple way of doing this would be, for example, to talk to a fiber channel switch and just disable that specific port that, that machine is linked into. With the obvious uh, implications and considerations with regards to redundant links, multi-path, and so forth, when we actually want to fence off a cluster, so we actually want to, we want to wall it in, we, we want to, our cluster node, we want to wall the node in as in not allowing it any access to the shared uh, resources anymore, then of course we also have to think about getting all of these links that we have to shared storage turned off. But generally speaking, going back to the, uh, to the, to the Greek reference, this would be a little like imprisonment rather than exile. So it's still in the same uh, it's still sort of in the, in, in, in the same general pattern of the node is still in the cluster, but we're not allowing it access to any of the shared resources that the rest of the cluster uh, can. Of course, that requires that uh, we are using something like a managed fiber channel switch, for example. We have to have some facility that we can use to automate shutting down access to this shared resource. Uh, it's worth noting that Pretty much any recovery from this requires some sort of manual intervention. So basically, re-enabling that port is something that pretty much has to be done uh, has to be done manually after making sure that the original problem that affected the node is resolved. But that's a general staple of um, of, of fencing recovery anyhow. 
if I can cut in for just a moment, one thing I'd like to mention about the power fencing, <clears throat> one of the benefits of power fencing is the only part it cares about is that the machine shut off. But most power fencing, as a courtesy, will try to reboot the node in the small hopes the machine will come back at a healthy state and the cluster will reassemble. With fabric fencing, that's not going to happen. A human has to come in, analyze the problem, and solve it themselves. <clears throat> so let's get a bit more to the main nitty gritty details of how this actually works. The cluster itself talks to a, or when the cluster decides a node needs to be fenced, it calls a caller. The caller understands the configuration, is able to look up things like the credentials for logging into the out band management or the PDU, gathers that up, and then sends it down to a caller, or sorry, to an agent. Or, in pacemaker terms, the stone is 